Chapter 3 is about matter and energy. Matter it may appear to be smooth and continuous, but it's actually not. If you keep cutting matter into smaller and smaller pieces, you get to a piece that you cannot cut. It will no longer be the same thing. And this smallest piece of matter is called an atom. In many cases, atoms are bonded together and the smallest piece of a substance may be a molecule. We've actually been able to see uh, images of atoms and molecule with today's microscopy. So matter is atoms and molecules. We want you to take a look at this aluminum can. It is made up of atoms of aluminum independent particles. Consider a bottle of isopropyl alcohol. It is matter. It's composed of atoms and molecules. And if you look closely, you'll see the molecule isopropyl alcohol. It's a pure substance made up of these molecules in liquid form. You should be able to visualize the various states of matter. They are solid, liquid, and gas. This is ice in a solid state. It's composed of water molecules closely packed together in order. Liquid water is composed of water molecules closely packed, but they can move and slip and slide in between each other. And gaseous molecules of water called steam are far apart and have freedom of motion. There are two different kinds of solids. A crystalline solid, such as this one, it's very orderly and neatly arranged, or an amorphous solid, in which the atoms are closely packed but not in perfect order. Sodium chloride is a crystalline solid. Here you see the well-ordered arrangement of sodium ions, purple, and chlorine ions. Uh, therefore, it's arranged in this nice order and has this cubic crystalline shape. Gases, which the molecules are far apart, can be compressed. Putting pressure on them pushes them closer together. They are said to be compressible. This summarizes the states of matter. The solid, the molecules only vibrate. They're close together and the shape of the solid is definite. Volume is definite. It cannot be compressed. Incompressible. The liquid, the molecules are still close together, but they're free to move about, slip and slide past one another. The shape is indefinite. A liquid assumes the shape of the container is poured into, and its volume is definite. It is also incompressible. A gas is free to move relative to one another. The molecules are far apart. Its shape is indefinite. Uh, in, again, it assumes, occupies the container that it's in, but no matter what the shape. And its volume is indefinite. It'll expand or fill the whole container and it is compressible. We can classify matter according to composition. Matter is either elements, compounds, or mixtures. A pure substance is made up of only one type of atom or molecule. A mixture is composed of two or more different kinds of substances. Uh, combined in various proportions, 2 to 1, 5 to 1, it doesn't matter. Here's an example of an element. This is helium. It is a pure substance composed of only one type of atom, the helium atom, which you see pictured here. Here's an example of a compound, water. Water is a pure substance. It composed only of water molecules pictured in the image here. But the water molecules have two elements present, 
hydrogen and oxygen in fixed definite proportion. All these two hydrogen molecules to one oxygen. Mixtures such as air and seawater are shown here. Air is predominantly uh, nitrogen molecule, which is an element, a diatomic element, and oxygen, a diatomic element. Seawater is composed of water plus the ions, the chloride ion and the sodium ion, which together were salt. This classification scheme is important to help you understand or classify matter. So matter can be only two types, a pure substance or a mixture. If it's a pure substance, it may be an element, only one kind of atom, or a compound which has one kind of molecule, definite different atoms combined in a molecule. Mixtures can be homogeneous, that is the same throughout, or heterogeneous, that they may be mixed, not completely mixed. Some part will settle out, some part will not mix with the other. This is like oil and water mixture. And this shows the molecular appearance of a homogeneous mixture distributed evenly throughout, and this of a uh, heterogeneous mixture with the oil rising to the top and the water molecules below. To summarize, matter may be a pure substance or it may be a mixture. And if it's a pure substance, it may be either an element or a compound. A mixture may be either homogeneous or heterogeneous. Mixtures may be composed of two or more elements, two or more compounds, or some combination of both. Substances have chemical properties and physical properties. A physical property is one that is displayed without changing the composition. A chemical property is one that's displayed by changing its composition. For instance, the odor of gasoline is a physical property. Uh, the flammability of gasoline is a chemical property. It will burn combined with oxygen. Let's look at physical properties. Boiling point of water is a physical property. It's always 100 degrees Celsius. When water boils, it is still water molecules in liquid form or water molecules in steam form. It changes from liquid to gas. Transformations from one state of matter to another, such as from solid to liquid, is always a physical change. A physical property like the boiling point of water is illustrated here. When you see the water boiling, it escapes as steam. Boiling water, steam escaping. We still have the same water molecules. Chemical property is illustrated here. Here we have an iron nail. It's composed of iron atoms, and it reacts with oxygen, the red atoms, to form iron oxide, or rust. So when iron rust, it turns to iron oxide. We have a change, a chemical change. Matter undergoes a chemical change when it undergoes a chemical reaction. In the chemical reaction, the substances present before the chemical reactions are called reactants. The substances present after are called products. So in a chemical change, the reactants undergo change to become new substances called products. In physical changes, the atoms that compose the matter do not change their fundamental association, even though the matter may change its appearance, like liquid water to steam. In chemical changes, atoms do change their fundamental association, resulting in matter with a new identity. A physical chain results in a different form of the same substance. A chemical chain results in a completely new substance. Here we have an example of a butane lighter. If you merely push the button here, 
you begin to release butane gas and that's merely a vaporization or a physical change from the liquid butane to the gaseous butane. But if you turn the wheel that causes the flint to spark, something else happens. The gaseous butane now combines with the oxygen in the air and makes water and carbon dioxide. This is an example of a chemical change. We can separate mixtures through physical changes by distillation. Distillation involves a mixture of liquids being boiled and the vapor, the more volatile components come forward and are condensed by this water jacket and they drip over into this only one component. The less volatile component remains behind. So this is a simple example of distillation. We can separate mixtures by filtration. If we have a solid and liquid, all we need to do is pour uh, through a funnel and the filter paper will collect the solid and the liquid will appear in the bottom, separating the two mixtures. Note that in any reaction, there's only conservation of mass. There's no new matter in, in uh, these chemical reactions and physical reactions. Using the principle of conservation of mass, we can do a simple idea. We can calculate mass. It's the total mass won't change. So, Let's suppose that we start with uh, 208 grams of oxygen and 58 grams of butane. And they react and form 176 grams of carbon dioxide and 90 grams of water. So here's the explained mathematical. If you add the mass of the reactants, you get 266 grams. If you add the mass of the products, you get 266 grams. So this should enable you to do some kinds of calculations for the missing mass. We begin the next part by looking at energy, and energy is a major component of our universe. We say energy is a capacity to do work, and work is defined as a result of a force acting on a distance. The behavior of matter is driven by energy. Understanding energy is critical to understanding chemistry. Different kinds of energy. There's kinetic energy, energy of motion, and potential energy, a kind of stored energy in virtue of its position. There's electrical energy, which is the flow of electrons. There's thermal energy, and that's our heat. Uh, it's associated with the random motion of atoms and molecules. And then there's chemical energy energy stored in the making and breaking of bonds. What are the units of energy? The SI unit is the joule, abbreviated capital J, and it's named after the English scientist James Joule, who demonstrated that energy could be converted from one type to another as long as the total energy was conserved. A second unit is called the calorie abbreviated small cal. The, the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of water, one gram or one milliliter of water by one degree Celsius. We also talk about calorie, food calories, with a capital C, and it's a larger unit. Um, it's a thousand little c's make a one big c. The little c calorie is also larger than a joule. It's a 4.184 joules required to make up one little cow. So therefore, we also measure energies, especially electricity, in a form of kilowatt hours. These are the common units of energy. Here's a table that shows you the conversion units, and we would use dimensional analysis to convert 
calories to joules uh, are, any, are any of these units. Here's an example of a conversion of units. The candy bar has got 225 calories, capital C, of nutritional energy. How many joules does it contain? The solution map is take the capital C, large calories, convert them to the small calorie, and then use the conversion factor to convert the small calorie to joules. The setup is used down here, showing 225 capital C calories converted ends up to be 9.41 times 10 to the 5 joules. Notice we keep three significant figures because the given amount had only three. Reactions sometimes require heat or they give off heat. This is an important term in chemistry. Exothermic means heat is given off, it's released. What it looks like in a diagram of energy is the reactants are at a higher energy state and as they move to products, this energy is released because the products have lower energy. We also have endothermic. Endothermic reactions, the reactants are started at a lower energy and you have to put in some energy to raise it to the energy level of the products. So exothermic and endothermic are important terms relating to chemical reactions. <clears throat> we measure temperature on three different scales. The Fahrenheit scale, the Celsius scale, and the Kelvin. The Fahrenheit scale is the one that we commonly use in the English countries. Uh, it is uh, zero degrees uh, Fahrenheit um, it's uh, to the freezing point of concentrated salt water is 96 degrees Fahrenheit to body temperature. These are the different kinds of, uh, of temperature scales. On the Fahrenheit scale, water freezes at 32. So we watch the temperature to make sure that uh, if the temperature is going to be 32, we know we might encounter ice on the roadways. On Celsius scale, water freezes at zero and boils at 100. The Kelvin scale avoids negative temperatures by assigning zero Kelvin to the coldest temperature possible, called absolute zero. Let's take a look at these thermometers and get an idea how they compare. Here you have the Fahrenheit, and you have shown here uh, the freezing point of water. It's 32 for the Fahrenheit, it's uh, 0 for Celsius, and it's 273.15 for Kelvin. Uh, the boiling points arrive at the same 212 Fahrenheit, 100 Celsius, and 373.15 Kelvin. And absolute 0 is 0 Kelvin, minus 273.15 Celsius, and minus 459.5 Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. It's important that you have this image of these thermometers so you understand. In going from freezing to boiling, it requires 180 degrees Fahrenheit. In going from freezing to boiling, it requires 100 degrees Celsius. How do we convert between temperature scales? It's very easy. If we want Kelvin, we simply take the given degrees Celsius and add 273.15 to it, and we'll get the Kelvin temperature. If we want um, Celsius and we're given Fahrenheit, we put the degrees Fahrenheit in it and subtract the 32 so you could get it down to the basic zero point, freezing 32 minus 32 is zero, and then divide the number by 1.8. Heat is an important form of energy and we talk about a sub called heat capacity. It's named uh, uh, Q. Heat is a symbol of Q. Uh, basically the quantity of heat 
in joules required to change the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. This is called the specific heat capacity. It has units of joules per gram. Notice that the values of, of specific heat capacity are different. Uh, water has the highest specific heat capacity on the list. Uh, therefore, it's a good insulator. Uh, if we look on the list, metals have low heat specific heat capacity. It takes very little heat to warm up a metal. But water, 4.184 joules per gram de to per degree Celsius. How do we calculate the heat, Q? We do that by taking the mass in grams times the specific heat capacity called capital C, which is in fact uh, joules per gram per degree, and times the change in temperature which is a degree. You will note then that the uh, uh, joules per gram per degree is canceled by the temperature and by the mass, and you end up with Q in joules. Here's an example of a problem. Gallium is a solid at 25 degrees, but melts at 29.9 degrees. If you hold gallium in your hand, it melts from your body heat. So how much heat must 2.5 grams of gallium absorb from your hand to raise its temperature from 25 to 29.9? And the specific heat capacity of gallium is 0.372 joules per gram per degree Celsius. So we list the given. We have the grams of gallium, that's its mass. We have the temperature, 25, and the ending temperature, 29. We can calculate the change in temperature by taking 29.9 minus 25. It's a 4.9 degrees Celsius that it changes. And we have the heat capacity. 0.372 joules per gram degree Celsius. Find Q. Well, we basically take these four quantities to get Q, and we use this equation. Take the mass times the C times the delta T, which I mentioned before was 4.9. So this is substituting into this form to calculate the heat required.